Chapter five, um, lecture notes, telescopes, telescopes. All right, telescopes are the tool of the trade for astronomers. We've already talked about it last um, last section about the spectra and that, that we're trying to um, pick up the spectrum, take a look at it, spectroscopy. Okay, and we use that, we get these spectroscopies, we get the uh, spectra and that with telescopes. Stars and other celestial bodies are too far away to test directly. Astronomers passively collect radiation emitted from distant ob objects, electromagnetic radiation. Um, extremely faint objects make collection of radiation difficult. So these, uh, we all know, all you got to do is look in the night sky and you can see it's, you can look up there and you can tell it's hard to see what's going on up there. All right. So we have specialized instruments. Um, we need to measure the brightness, spectra and positions with high precisions. Um, and for this, we use mostly mirrored telescopes and observatories. And this is the crazy thing about it. We're look, used to looking, whenever we talk about a telescope, we, we think about looking through um, an eyepiece. But that's not the way it's done anymore. Most of the time, it's a computer terminal. All the um, telescopes have been hooked up to computer terminals. The powers of a telescope. You probably didn't know telescope had powers. Anyway, collecting power. The bigger the telescope, the more light it collects. Okay. Um, and then we have focusing power. That's using mirrors or lenses to bend the path of light rays to create images. And then, of course, resolving power. Resolving power is that... Um, that which helps us to pick out details, a high resolution or a high resolving power, you'll be able to see the craters on the moon better. And um, properties of that type of manner. Light gathering power, light collected, proportional to the collecting area. Um, your pupil, um, your eye pupil has a collecting area, um, a mirror, or a lens for a telescope, okay? So your eye has a collector area as do a tel telescopes. Uh, telescopes funnel light into our eyes for a brighter image. Small changes in collector radius give larger changes in numbers of photons caught. So the whole object is to catch as many photons as we can and um, put those into our eye, those photons, let them hit our eye. And you can see here, Small amount of photons in this collector area. This has a larger collector area, so it collects more light, and it makes the image brighter. Focusing power. Refraction. Okay, When light travels through an object, we learned this um, in the last uh, chapter. When light travels through a different medium, it changes speed. Okay, So light moving at an angle from one material to another will bend due to a product a process called refraction. Refraction occurs because the speed of light is different in different materials. Refraction. All right, a light beam in the air is coming down and it hits this object. When it hits this object, it slows. This part will slow down before this. And it's showing here, out here, how um, two people are holding onto each other as they go around a corner. This person's going to have to move faster. He has more distance to cover than this. So um, same is going on here. Light on the side of the beam is still in the air and thus not slowed down yet. So this out here is not slowed down when this is. Um, <clears throat> light on this side of the beam enters the medium first and is slowed, causing the beam to be deflected. Light beam uh, in a denser substance such as a glass of water. And that's what this is showing just saying this is a glass of water. But because of this property right here, how it hits, this slows down before this, it causes it to refract, refract. Refracting telescopes. They use that refraction to um, focus light. Notice the man in the middle here, Mr. Einstein. Einstein. A lens deploys, um, or a lens employs refraction to bend light. Telescopes that employ lenses to collect and focus light are called refracting telescope or refractors. Refractors, that means they have a 
lens. They have a lens. Disadvantages to refractors, and I'm going to tell you this is one of your homework questions. Lenses have many disadvantages in large telescopes. Large lenses are extremely expensive to fabricate. A large lens will sag in the center since it can only be supported on the edges. Dispersion causes images to have colored fringes, and many lens materials absorb short wavelength light. Okay, so these are the disadvantages to a refractor or refra refracting telescope, excuse me. All right, reflecting telescopes. Um, we use mirrors with reflecting telescopes. The nice thing about a mirror is it can be, and it, it'll probably be on the next screen, but um, you can support them from any place. It doesn't have to be around the edge. And you can see this mirror. Here's a person. This is a huge mirror, all right? And it could be um, supported by nothing more than a simple post behind it, okay? So reflectors are used almost exclusively by astronomers today. The big reflecting telescopes we have are the Twin Keck telescopes located. Yes, there are two of them. Twin te Keck telescopes located um, on the 14,000-foot volcanic peak, um, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And there um, are 10-meter collector mirrors. They have 10-meter collector mirrors. Um, light is focused in front of that mirror. A secondary mirror may be used to deflect the light to the side or through a hole in the primary mirror. And multiple uh, multi-mirror instruments and extremely thin mirrors are two modern approaches to dealing with large pieces of glass in a telescope system. All right. So a lot of times what they'll do is, and I think we could see that if we look back here, you'll see this 10 meter mirror is individual mirrors put together to form one large mirror makes it easier okay so there's different styles of reflectors first there's the prime focus you can see um, the light comes in and is there's usually a camera here and a lot of times it says they ride in a cage they're inside the telescope the observers inside the telescope uh, Kessler grand focus is when there is a second mirror that reflects it to your eyes. You'll still look through the end of the tube. And then, of course, the Newtonian for focus. And this is where there's an angled lens or mirror in there. I shouldn't say a lens, a mirror. And it hits that and goes out the side of the telescope for us to view. Resolving power. A telescope's ability to discern detail is referred to as a resolving power. Resolving power is limited by the wave nature of light through a phenomenon called diffraction. And here is some diffraction. Uh, rarefaction or it, it is when it bends. Okay, the light bends here. It's just redirected. It's showing water waves, but it's redirected instead of bending. Um, and that's called diffraction. Waves are diffracted as they pass through narrow openings. A diffracted point source of light appears as a point surrounded by rings of light over here. Here's our point and the rings of light around it. Two points of light separated by an angle in <clears throat> can be seen at wavelengths um, only if a telescope diameter satisfies this um, equation right here. All right, with this equation, we can determine the um, resolution and what we can see. So to get rid of these narrow um, openings, okay, and these um, uh, different wavelengths of light, these circles of light around it, is we use telescopes like this. We increase the resolving power with an interferometer. And what it, that does is I have three telescopes right here. Okay. They are widely spaced apart, but they all focus at the same star. And what's happening here, I'm going to jump back a little bit. This opening, um, these openings like this, I've taken this small opening here now, and I've made it this big, the distance between all these telescopes. So now I have a gigantic opening. All right, and that's what an interferometer does. It takes everything, combines it, uh, takes the images from each telescope, combines it into this large um, opening area. 
For a given wavelength, the resolution is increased for a larger telescope diameter. Now I have this huge telescope diameter. Inter interferometer accomplishes this by simultaneously combining observations from two or more widely spaced telescopes. So I've taken that small um, diameter and increased it greatly with an interferometer. So here is a great example. This is what you would see. As I have a higher resolution, I notice there are two objects here, not just one large object, but two smaller objects. The resolution is determined by the individual telescope separations and not the individual diameters of the telescopes themselves. Key to the process is the wave nature of interference and um, the electronic processing of the waves from various telescopes. So again, as I get better resolution, I get a better um, picture of what's going on. Detecting the light. The human eye, once used with a telescope to record observations or make sketches, not good at detecting faint light, even with the 10 meter Keck telescope. So our eyes are not that great at picking up this faint light, even when you have a great telescope like Keck. Photographic film is not very good either. Only 4% of striking photons are recorded on film. So chemically stored data. And then the other thing with uh, film is it fades after a while. And um, you'll even lose some of that 4%. Electronic detectors are the way to go. Incoming photons strike an array of semiconductor pixels that are coupled to a computer. This gives us 75% possible efficiency over uh, the 4% of the film and, and the eye. So what we do is we use these charged couple or a charge coupled device, CCDs. They're 20 times more sensitive to faint light than film, photograph film. And how this works is incoming light strikes a semiconductor surface. Here's our photons coming in, freeing up electrons. The number of electrons is proportional to the intensity of the photons or the light. And the amount of charge liberated is read out to a computer to create an image. All right, so non-visible wavelengths. Um, <clears throat> we were just talking about this and sometimes uh, we can look, not sometimes, we can look at things that the human eye, that is outside of our spectrum that we can see, all right? Non-visible wavelengths. Many astronomical objects radiate in wavelengths other than visible. Cold gas clouds radiate in the radio, uh, radio wavelengths. Dust clouds radiate in infrared. Hot gases around black holes emit x-rays. And you can see um, the different things we see with, well, infrared and X-ray uh, wavelengths in that, okay? And these um, different telescopes take that and translate it into what we can see. And this is just, that's awesome. Radio observatories. Um, if you watched any of the movie, you see they're using radio telescopes. They pick up radio waves from outer space. Radio waves from space, um, signals are focused here and carried by a cable to a control room. An antenna, that's 10.4 uh, meters in diameter, this is the antenna. And that is how a radio obs um, observer oh boy. observatory or radio telescope work. Here's some radio observations. False coloring images are typically used to depict wavelength distributions and non-visible observations. All of this uh, is telling us is that it takes things we can't see, um, the computers do, and forms them into an image, a colored image that we can see. And remember those atmospheric windows. We've seen this picture before. All right. Um, only certain... Only certain um, wavelengths make it through to our uh, surface. Uh, X-rays are absorbed. Um, gamma, some gamma rays are, this stuff is absorbed. So we have to look for atmospheric windows. Like a radio telescope works absolutely fine. Um, optical telescopes work somewhat, but still some of the wavelengths are filtered out by our atmosphere. So here are some of the major 
um, space observatories or telescopes. The Hubble is, to me, the Hubble is the greatest thing ever. Um, it is just the greatest telescope. It's about the size of a school bus, all right? And that's floating around out there orbiting the Earth and getting great pictures. Here's the uh, um, Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer that's out there, the UV. Then there's the Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope, and the Chandra X-ray telescope. Why do we put them in space? Simple. It's to cut down on the um, filtration from the atmosphere. Space versus ground based observatories. Space-based advantages, freedom from atmospheric blurring, freedom from the atmospheric absorption. Ground-based advantages, larger collecting powers, and equipment is easily fixed. Um, when something happens on one of these out here in space, uh, we just, you know, since we don't have um, the space shuttle anymore, the um, Space shuttle was made to repair that Hubble, or the Hubble was made so we could use the space station or the space, geez, the uh, space shuttle to repair it. But now it doesn't work anymore. We don't use that. So, um, but the ground based consideration is weather, humidity, and haze, and of course, the dreaded light pollution. Observatories, different telescopes. The immense telescopes and their associated equipment require observatories to facilitate, facilitate their use and protection from the elements. Thousands of observatories are scattered throughout the world and are on every continent, including Antarctica. Some of the major observatories, the twin 10-meter Keck telescopes, they're the largest in the United States. Hobie Eberly Telescope uses 91 one-meter mirrors set and an 11 meter disc. Oop. And the largest optical telescope, the very large telescope, is in Chile, and it is an array of four eight meter mirrors. To observe at a major observatory, an astronomer must, an astronomer must submit a proposal to a committee that allocates telescope time. If given observing, observing time, assure all necessary equipment and materials will be available. Be prepared to observe at various hours of the day. Here's the other thing that's that's kind of cool is um, you if you have a proposal, you can go to any of these telescopes and request time. They will give you time to use it. So it's kind of cool um, that anybody can really use it. Uh, mostly it's going to be for colleges and that or scientists, but anyone can go to those and, and get time. Astronomers may also observe via the Internet. Large data archives now exist for investigations covering certain wavelengths, sometimes for the entire sky. Archives help better prepare astronomers for on-site observations at an observatory. So you can also go online and um, find um, recordings of these um, telescopes that you can look at and um, enjoy. Computers and astronomy, for many astronomers, operating a computer and being able to program are more important than knowing how to use a telescope. Computers accomplish several tasks. They solve equations, they move telescopes and feed in information to detectors, convert data to useful form, um, networks for communication and data exchange. And I do know that right now at NASA, this is what they're looking for, computer accomplish people that can work on computers and set this stuff up. Um, that's what they're looking for right now and hiring for at NASA. Now, we also have scintillation. And, and when you look up at a star and you see that star twinkling in the night sky, this is what it is going through, scintillation. Um, refraction is also responsible for seeing a twinkling of stars, a.k.a. scintillation. Temperature density, temperature and density differences in pockets of air shift the image of the star slightly, and it causes it to twinkle in the night sky. And then, of course, there's atmospheric blurring. The condition of the sky for viewing is referred to as seeing. Distorted seeing can be improved by adaptive optics, which employs a powerful laser correcting mirrors to offset uh, scintillation. Many telescopes are built in high altitude dry environments to reduce this. But you can see what they'll do is they shoot a laser beam at a star 
and all the mirrors focus on the laser beam and um, that um, cuts back on the scintillation. And the other thing that makes looking at the night sky hard is light pollution. And they always show us the United States, but at nighttime, you can tell where the population of the United States, the most densely populated areas, um, New York and along the coast here, here's Chicago. Um, and it's hard, the darker the area, uh, you can see the light pollution again, California out here. Um, the darker the area, the um, better it is for that telescope to cut back on light pollution. So we look for the, those areas um, to view the night sky. I was in Michigan here a few weeks ago, and they do have a national dark area um, for taking your telescope and setting it up. It's one of the darkest places in the United States. That's it for the notes on telescopes, chapter 5.